Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the Iridium Jazz Club here in New York City. For 20 years, the band Groove Collective has toured all over the world, bringing their infectious grooves from funk to Afrobeat to bebop, jazz, soul, R&B, hip hop, you name it. Tonight we're going to sit down and talk with some of the original members and co-founders of Groove Collective and talk about one, why their music is very relevant now versus when they started in the early 1990s. <laughs> seems like just watching Soundcheck just a second ago, you guys are stronger than the Band of Brothers. Yeah, well, we are, we are like a family, that's for sure, with all the, uh, with all the infighting, and, uh, you know, but it's great. We love it. You know, it's great to be uh, still doing it after all this time. 20 years, you guys have grown. You guys have families. You guys have kids. You guys never completely broke up. It's just you guys kind of picked up where you left off. Yeah, I mean, there have been there have been some different incarnations, some hiatuses. Is that the plural of hiatus? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, but but we've always been cl we've always been close friends, so it's it's been a really natural thing to get back together, and the music is just there for us waiting. Now I understand. Now part of the twentieth anniversary, you guys have just done some show. You just came back from Mexico City, and you guys are going to be doing a big reunion show at the Brooklyn Bowl coming next month. What is it about? 20 years now that has kept you guys together and why are you relevant now versus when you guys first started in the early 90s mm, that's a good question um well i think um you know actually it's a, there's an interesting parallel in the 90s when we came out there was a uh, you know a lot of the, the dj thing going on and uh, it was there was this crossing between some of the li with live and the dj thing and since then you know obviously it's all, even more electronics and djs and taking over everything so um kind of glad to still be be here playing grooves you know and having people dance to a live band and um and also you know new york also really uh has always been that melting pot vibe lots of different types of music coming together and uh i think it's important for a band like us to to keep trying to mix it together bringing different people together you know genres always tend to um in different um styles tend to always sort of breed you know separation of people and i think we like to you know represent something that you know some bring together some different things you know i mean that's how i like to see it and you guys are the melting pot of new york city i mean there is a hodgepodge of everything i mean you listen to everything in this city and i think that was really and still is the authenticity of this group well you said it i, I agree <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean yeah it's it's just been there have been a lot of different um, ideas of, within the group even of what we should be and what movement we're out of. 
but really it's always just been this thing that we do when these people come together and it's always um, it's always something unique because the strong personalities creative people and um, the actual thing is is always something special and unique rather than being this thing we've been able to preconceive or or pre-design <laughs> The vibe is projected, yo, push that protected, yo, bad perspective. Most of all this time, let's have a kick the ground. Let's sit up, check the storyline. Uh, long ago, far away, they called me Gordon Clay. But now I'm Nappy G, I got my group collective family. All my brothers to the right and the left of me. We go back many, many years. It's been many, many tears, but we winding, going forward, moving on, going higher. versus when you guys started in the early 90s? Well, we were relevant then. I feel like we're relevant now. Somewhere in the middle, the pendulum swung a little bit and swinging back towards live sounds and live music. There's this kind of, uh, there's the jam band scene, there's the live bands and hip hop. Um, there's been kind of a resurgence in, in people appreciating musicianship. Things have gotten kind of so far in the extreme of electronic production, which I also do and we all love and respect, but a lot of people have gotten away from the skills and the foundation of the old kind of techniques of how you learn to play an instrument and, and listening to the masters and, and going out and jamming for hours at a time. And we still have that element and I think people want to see that again. It's come back, so we're happy about it. Groove Collective started out as part of, if I understood it, the Giant Steps music nights here in New York City. How did this really kind of come into fruition? Well, um, a, a bunch of us were playing downstairs at, uh, it was Metropolis at the time, I think now it's called uh, Blue Water Grill on uh, 14th Street, Union Square, uh, not 14th Street, but it's right off of Union Square there. And downstairs they'd have like, they had this underground kind of club there. Giant Step would do the Thursday night, uh, every Thursday night party. And basically it was DJ most of the night, but a couple of musicians would come and sit in. That consisted of uh, Richard Worth and uh, Nappy uh, Gordon. Um, the two of them uh, were the two, I think, the first guys, and Ital, the keyboard player, and myself, and Jonathan. Yeah. In the early days, but yeah. We were kind of, people would come in and out, you know, but there, it was basically, I think, with me, me, uh, Nappy, and Richard sort of did that for, for, for many years doing that, um, even beyond, after Groove Collective um, was, was playing out. But uh, most of the other cats were playing upstairs. Um, they were doing the jazz that th that set at the dinner for the dinner crowd upstairs, um, and they kept seeing all the the young ladies coming downstairs. They figured, you know, something must be going on down there. So, so they came down, and uh, you know, before you knew it, we had a we had a lot of people down there playing because we had Bill, you know, on vibes, Fabio on trumpet, Jan Sax, Josh on trombone, and uh, and Chris was also there playing, and um, and eventually we uh, the Giant Step. Um, it was Morris and Jonathan. They uh, they were doing some different promoting, and they had a, um, a singer poet 
Dana Bryan at the time, and they, we wanted to put a band together to back her up. And so they sort of gathered us all together to do that. And uh, one night she was sick and couldn't make the show, and we were already all there. We said, all right, let's, let's just play anyway. And so that was the first official, like, group collective. Nels? It was Nels, yeah. Do you remember Nels? Of course. Oh, you know? Oh, yeah. Tell me about the, the process of this band's chemistry as far as the horns. Someone has to arrange the horn lines. Someone has to arrange the 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 the, the timbales and the the percussion. I mean, this is an intense group within eight to ten of you guys. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a process for sure. Um, I think with you know, the horns mainly. I mean, basically, we sort of work in units for the most part, where you have the horns working uh, with the heads and the arrangements and figuring that stuff out. Um, uh, the bass and the keys are kind of figuring out harmonically what the underbelly will be, hopefully along with me, if they let me get in edgewise there. And percussion always also tends to have their have their unit. Um, have, that has switched up a little bit through the years because, you know, we used to have always two percussionists get down to one percussion, so then sometimes drums and percussion were trying to work something together. And also because we had vibes before that, we would sort of go swing between percussion and harmonic and also the horns of soloists. Um, and some, and so it's always been a mix because also you, you generally you tend to have the percussionists, you know, they get centered on percussion centric ideals and the horn players tend to gravitate towards the, the maybe more uh, jazz aesthetic as, and sometimes the keys and depending on who's on playing the keys and, you know, um, I know, I don't know. I mean, I think me and Jonathan have always been sort of the people bringing in more of the dance aesthetic probably than anyone else. Some, you know, the hip hop, the funk, the, you know, whatever, you know, the soul and stuff. And, and we like to definitely make sure that's in there. And it's, you know, so, so it's always a struggle, you know, it's a push and shove, you know. Tell me about why Groove Collective is very, very relevant in these times. Well, uh, the band, you know, besides its musicianship, um, is also kind of reaching uh, into more spontaneity uh, and not so much design, you know, and uh, in that way it's kind of fresh, you know. A lot of originality when you when you go for it like that. You don't have these prescribed uh, directions that you know that you've already kind of hashed out. You're trying to get something new to um, you know to spring up. So uh, it's been an approach that uh, 
they've been considering lately and it seems to be uh, bringing some fresh, you know, music forward. One of the things that I really, and we talked about this earlier, when I saw you guys in Detroit back in the early 2000s, you guys are really kind of on the cusp of something that is really hitting here in the United States as well as abroad. You guys started doing Afrobeat before Afrobeat was really kind of in vogue. Yeah, I, want, I mean, you know, uh, that might be true. Um, I mean, we were definitely listening to Fela Records, um, and one of our good friends who's actually played with us, uh, Victor Axelrod, is in that group, Antibalas, that has really, really done, done so much. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, that's, always, that's always been important music to us, that sound. Um, I mean, that and James Brown, like, so, I mean, it's just, yeah, that just had a big effect on us of different ways of being a large ensemble, featuring horns, but not, you know, not always being a funk horn section or just that African sound, multi, like multiple horns, low horns, Jay on the baritone saxophone, um, trombones, that low sound. Um, yeah, Fela. I mean, it's important music. I mean, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know that. We, again, we've, uh, for better or for worse, we've always done our own little version of it. Like it's always been our take. We've never been great at copying exactly what what whatever that is. Like, or it becomes. It combines with something else that we're doing. So whether it becomes Afro Latin or, um, but yeah, it's important. And we and we've been doing, we've been into it for a long time. I mean, because Brooklyn kind of put. <laughs> Afrobeat back on the global, you know, diaspora again. I mean, and you guys were doing it like on, what is it? Not the Drunken Master. Was that the Drunken Master? Second record. We actually had a Lois Side. I mean, really is. Af even though it's a tribute to Lois Side, it's actually an Afrobeat kind of groove on that one. So you know, I mean, yeah, that, that was a. Uh, yeah, we we were very uh, happy to have the the, the Fela influence. Although I don't know if we. You know, like Jonathan was saying, we weren't specifically saying, okay, let's, you know, analyze exactly what was going on with the with the Fela stuff. It was more that we were just very inspired by it. But, um, yeah, like since then, people have obviously, like, gone really into the, you know, really dissecting it and, and recreating it, um, which is great. I mean, I actually had, I was lucky enough to see Fela when he came to New York. My, my dad took me um, at the Felt Forum. It was right after he got out of prison, so I was, I was, I was very young at the time. But it was a great experience to see that. Like you know, it's one of those things where you just don't you don't forget that. Uh, I always have to thank my dad for for hooking me up and exposing me to all kinds of you know stuff like that. So. <laughs> that you have done with Groove Collective is that you've brought your your musical and also your nationality to the to the music mm -hmm. and I think that's what made this music so authentic is that you weren't copying anything it's just that here are eight to ten guys bringing what they grew up listening to in New York City 
to the world. Right, absolutely. I think that's one of the things I, we get asked that question a lot, and I think it's I said it's it's it's, it's very it, it's. It would be, it's really important that people realize that what we grew up with in New York, because it's such a closed space, is all these different cultures melding and growing consistently. So it's not so strange, you know, that I'm Colombian American, that, and that there's, you know, you're around by, you know, I played with Eddie Palmieri, I got to play with Ray Barreto, you know, and, and then, of course, I played with merengue bands growing up, you know, and then I played funk. Soul music, you know, so I, and it, it wasn't so, it, they were always melding, it wasn't so strange that, they, you know, so, uh, so I, I think, uh, you know, and now as, as we get older, you know, we realize I'm, I'm, I'm digging more into my Afro Colombian roots and in some of the records we started using instruments like gaitas and flauta mios. Now there's world music and there's a whole thing with Afro Colombian music that seems to be kind of hot or something or people like DJs are using it and I'm like, guys, I've been, this is what it is. We've been here. <laughs> but, you know, it's always... But anyway, but it's been really... Yeah, it is great. And everybody brings their experience to this group like that. And I think it's, I think one of the things that we have to remember to keep it that way in the Groove Collective, to keep it alive by, by letting each other uh, breathe our ideas and thoughts uh, musically. Because as we get older, we have, you know, there's other things that we, we attach to. I love hip hop and we love it. Who doesn't love Jay Dilla? Who doesn't love, you know? And now there seems to be a resurgence now, to 2012, of, of younger cats like, uh, you know, Robert Glasper, you know, and uh, and there's some promoters who are, do, who are working with that. And I, and I'm trying to explain. To them. I said, man, and they're young. And I'm trying. To, I said, you know, I should be working with you because, you know, Guru Jazzmatazz. I was there in the original band, you know, and I went to Europe with DJ Premier. And, you know, I'm trying to explain to them that this is. Sometimes people don't want to acknowledge what's already been there, and, and it, it hasn't been that long ago. I mean, even though it was a while ago, but it's not that long ago, you know. And so people don't even know, you know, that the, that Groove Collective ha has had these roots. I mean, it's good for us for you to be doing this because people have to realize there's an awareness because you forget people for forget, and later on they go, oh wow, you know, these guys were you know, were checking it out. They were doing it when when you know like Tupac, like you know Jonathan and, and Genji played with Tupac, you know. I mean, they were like the real, and they, they, there was a relationship. It wasn't just like something that the industry made. You know, there was a reason. There was a reason why that happened. So the idea of jazz and hip-hop, and it's, and it's coming back, which I'm really happy because there's a lot of new, young, great players doing great things, you know. And I remember speaking to some really great jazz artists at that time, who I had the pleasure of working with, Roy Hargrove and all these cats, and, and they were all, Roy was very open, but there were some other cats, I'm not going to mention, were like, oh, no, you know, the, the idea of groove, they weren't buying it. Meanwhile, I'm like, what are you talking about, man? You sound like you're 100 years old. This is not new, you know? And then some people wanted to jump on the bandwagon or be part of it, and other people didn't. And then later on, years that passed by, it's funny, the younger cats, I mean, the older cats, like, I remember being in, we were in, uh, in Madarao, and, 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 and we were playing with, uh, with, um, along with B.B. King and, and, and the Carnegie Hall Big Band with John Faddis. All the cats, Bobby Watson, Alex Foster, they're all my friends and mentors, older cats playing th alto. And, th and, they, and they stepped up. And I was like, man, you guys should sit in. They sat in and played with the groove. Club. They were having a ball. They got it, you know. These are the older cats, right? They knew it was about. The younger cats were like, oh, oh no, man. I don't want, I'm like, what, you think you're going to lose your, what, you, your, your jazzness? You're cool. You're going to lose your... That's ridiculous. Miles would have laughed at that. I'm like, what the hell? Yeah, you, you know? But it just shows so that mentality or that fear of not being, you know, is completely lost. Now it's great because, you know, it's just there. People are accepting it. You know, musicians are, you know, then right away, you know, Bradford, you know, the Buckshot LaFunk, he was always open, of course. But, you know, he right away is like, I remember him coming to Giant Step and sitting in, you know, so he was already open, you know. You know, he knew it wasn't so. He wanted to check out what was going on. That's why Bradford's very open and hip. I think that's part of it, yeah.
decided to join Groove Collective because at 20 years you guys really must love and hate each other and respect the art of the music to keep doing this for so long. Well, uh, Jay, yeah, it's, it's been kind of a uh, you know, rite of passage. I think anybody who's watched the group evolve. I mean, I think this was a really opportune way to uh, get immersed in uh, the current of things that's uh, happening in New York City a certain period of time. You know, there's no, I don't, I don't know that I can really isolate my decision from the evolution of the band. You know, it's just, there was a bunch of stuff that was going on. Um, but we had an opportunity, I can say, to uh, explore different ideas and polyphony, different ideas and harmony and rhythm that uh, sort of, that were, uh, at the same time that, we're, that there were different advances in production, DJ culture, at the same time we were trying to replicate things of that nature with live instruments. And uh, it was neat because it was all happening simultaneously. Um, it's a cool part of it. Your party scene. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report reporting live here at the Iridium Jazz Club here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank the guys of Groove Collective for their time, as well as the staff and management here at the Iridium. As always, please visit my website, www.thepaceyourpoint.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Remember, until the next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace. Yeah.